Okay, Luke chapter 15, like I said, I'm going to start reading in verse 11. It says there, Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against, you, against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, look, uh, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slavering for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, um, I mentioned that this parable is traditionally called the parable of the prodigal son. In uh, my Bible, and uh, if you're reading the church Bibles, there's a title at the top. It says the parable of the lost son. Um, and uh, here's the thing. I don't, want, I don't want for you to have it be obscured that this parable is not about one son, but two. And uh, it's important that you know that. In, in fact, it might be the, the second son who uh, plays the larger role in this parable by the time it's all said and done. And uh, there's really two acts, so to speak, to this, uh, to this uh, play, if, if I can put it in that terms. Uh, act number one, younger brother. Act number two, or scene number two, older brother. The first scene, act number one with the younger brother, starts out with a speech. You find it in verse 12. This is what he says. Father, give me my share of the estate. Um, what you have to understand, uh, especially in that culture, was that this was incredibly offensive. Here, here's what he wanted. Um, when in, in Middle Eastern times uh, a father died, the estate would be split between uh, the, the sons that he had, in this case, two sons. So uh, at, at the point of his death after he died, it would be then that the estate would be divided and each son would get his portion. And this son is basically saying, I can't wait till you die. Give me now what I'll get then. In other words, I don't want you. I want your stuff. And um, just to kind of help us gather thoughts, I want you to realize that this speech really, it has sort of two components. One is the thing he said out loud. I don't want you, I just want your stuff. I wish you were dead already. Um, I can't stand you, just give me the stuff. That's the first thing, but I, I want you not to miss the kind of public humiliation and shame this would have caused the father. And then the next line says this, so he divided his property between them. And um, it's interesting, the, the Greek word for property is the word bios. Um, we, we have it in English in, in words like biology. Uh, it really says something like this, he divided his life. 
between them. And um, here materially is what would have happened. He would have had to go into town. He would have had to put a for sale sign on his property. He would have had to sell off a, a, a portion of all the land that he owned. And uh, someone would have came and purchased that. And uh, they would have turned that into some kind of cash that the son could have taken and, and left with. And so uh, here's what happened. It, it, there's like the, this tremendous cost, right? Because now his livelihood, his life, uh, half of it or a portion of it, it it's gone. I mean, it's sold away. It will never be his again. His ability to sustain his family has been reduced by the portion that he's given to this younger son who said, Father, I, I just wish you were dead. And uh, now imagine going into town. Hey, why are you selling your property? Well, you know, my son... Uh, he wants it now. He can't wait till I'm dead. I mean, especially in a culture like that where it was a communal culture and everyone was connected. I mean, it was tremendously shameful, tr shameful, tremendously humiliating. And uh, the action would have caused just great shame and great humiliation to the father. Uh, you can see, I mean, this is, it's unheard of. Who does this kind of thing? Only the, the worst of people would ever do this. Dad, I wish you were dead just give me your stuff now, and I'm out of here. Rebellious, sinful. I mean, he, he goes off and, and, you know, wastes it all away with prostitutes and wild living. I mean, this is a sinner. The older son, too, gives a speech finally. Here's what finally happens is this, this younger brother comes to his senses. He realizes, what am I doing? Uh, I've wasted it all away. My father's servants at home, they have more than I do. Let me go back. I'll be one of my father's servants. I'll try to pay him back. And uh, of course, uh, and we'll get to it, there's this tremendous show of love where the father, he won't hear anything of it. He's not going to be one of his servants. He's not going to let the son try to pay him back. He, he, he embraces him. He, he runs to him. There's this tremendous show of grace. And uh, there's a celebration. I mean, his son was as good as dead to him. They'd been estranged. They, were, they, they weren't speaking to each other. And now the son's come back. Then he puts on the robe and he kills a fattened calf and he throws a feast. Now, in that culture, when the father uh, kills the fattened calf, I mean, a calf is a lot of meat. And so you'd invite everyone in the town at this party, at this feast. Everyone is there. And uh, the older brother, who um, has been with the father all the time, uh, should recognize this is the best day of his life. He can't believe that this has finally happened to him. And uh, it's just traditional in that culture that the older son would play host to all the guests who come. And so what happens, the second speech is uh, just as shocking. And although, on the one hand, these two brothers couldn't be more different. One was rebellious, the other one loyal. One wa was wild, uh, the other one was faithful. Although on the surface they look totally different, in fact, as, as you analyze their speech, they're just the same. So here's what happens. It says in verse 25 that the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. He called on one of the servants. He asked him, hey, hey what's going on? And the answer is this, your brother's come. Your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the response to the other brother is like, great, I'm so happy for my father. Let me go in and celebrate. But instead, verse 28 says this, the older brother became angry. He refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, and uh, it's just shocking what he says. He doesn't even call him father. He says, look, old man. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeying your orders, yet you never gave me even a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Really interesting. I mean, the older son, it's like his true self comes out here. He really doesn't have a relationship with the father. He considers himself his father's slave. Look, old man. And um, here's what he finally says. I don't want you. I want your stuff. You won't even give me a young goat. I'd like to celebrate, not with you, with my friends. You see, he has the same speech. I don't want you, old man. I can't wait till you die either. I mean, all this whole time I've been slaving away. I thought at least I could get a goat. I mean, that's what I really want, your stuff. 
And I want you to, again, uh, to not be lost on this point that there's a great deal of public humiliation and shame. I mean, here it is, the best day of his life. He throws a whole feast. The entire town is there. Everyone's celebrating. What is the older son supposed to do? What do you expect? But instead, all the guests find out, well, he won't come in. And so the father, instead of, instead of continuing to celebrate, has to actually walk outside, leave the party in full view of everybody. How humiliating. How shameful. And so uh, here's the quick point that I want to make. It's, it's not a parable about one son. It's a parable about two sons, both of which don't have a relationship with the father, both of which the father is the one who's initiating going out to the sons. Both of them give a speech that basically says, I don't want you, I just want your stuff, and they both publicly shame him. Okay, um, this parable says some things about God, and here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to actually see it in its wider context Uh, This parable is part of a larger chapter, chapter 15. There's actually three parables here, and I'd like to take our time to just quickly go through these three parables, not just the one, so that you can begin to see the wider point. Uh, Let me just start in verse 1 of chapter 15 so you catch the context. Here's the context. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's the context into which Jesus tells this parable of these two sons. And uh, it won't take too much reflection to figure out that uh, there's Jesus. And then there's these sinners, these lost, horrible people. And uh, sitting there with him are these really religious, uh, good people. Um, you, You can already try to guess which one each of the sons is, as Jesus tells this parable, he begins to to say some things in response that I think tells us a lot about the heart of God. Verse 3, Jesus told them this parable, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And uh, let's just stop there because, I mean, we might be tempted to say, well, of course a a good shepherd would, but... um, Look at that question one more time. Uh, Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country? No. You know, no good shepherd would do that, right? I mean, I I don't know a lot about sheep, but one of the things I'm pretty sure of is this, that they have a special talent for getting lost. And uh, that's why this parable makes sense in its context. He's got 100 sheep. One of them gets lost. If he, if he has the 99, if he decides, okay, I'm going to leave these 99 in the open country and go after the one, what's probably going to happen? He's going to lose 10 more. You know, a rational, a sane person, a person who sort of calculates a risk, they, they don't leave the 99 in open country. They, they, they cut their losses and say, wow, man, I got to try harder. What have I done? Oh, oh, well, you know, that one's gone. You know, off to the wolves. But uh, Jesus says, uh, no way. This good shepherd, and of course, this is a parable about God, he, he does. He, he's got such a passion for that lost one that he leaves the 99 in open country. It's reckless. It's impulsive. But uh, he goes after it, and he finds it. And he, it says in verse 5, joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I've found my lost sheep. And Jesus says, I tell you that in the same way there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. I mean, what a statement about God, right? There's sort of this impulsive, even reckless uh, kind of pursuit that God has for those who are lost. And uh, by the way, as Christians, I want to make sure that you understand this parable right because it's possible that as I read this parable, you... um, started to identify with with the 99. Um, And if you have, you've heard it all wrong. Um, Let's just, we do this every Sunday. Let's rehearse the message of the Bible. Uh, I usually do it with three words, sin, salvation, service, right? Uh, Under the heading of sin, uh, at some point, I I mean, I came to realize that I don't measure up to God's standard. Uh, I sin against him constantly. I'm committing crimes in my thoughts, words, and deeds. I came to realize that I'm naturally bent in on myself. I'm selfish and self-oriented. I don't have this natural tendency to love God or my neighbor. I I have this natural tendency to to want everything from them. 
And um, here's the thing about God. As you begin to read about him in the Bible, it becomes very clear that he's the epitome of everything good. He's totally righteous, which means he can't wrap his arms around us. He's totally just, which means that he must punish sins and crimes wherever they're committed. And the Bible actually says this, that the punishment for sin is death. In fact, um, Romans 6.23 says this, the wages of sin is death. What sin deserves or what sin earns is this punishment of death. And uh, finally, when we talk about sin, I always make sure to point this out. The Bible makes this point very, very clear. Uh, There's nothing we can do to make ourselves acceptable to God. It doesn't matter how hard we try. It doesn't matter how religious we become. Uh, This is the point. Good works won't work. We're actually increasing our guilt every single day. It doesn't matter how many good things we do. It doesn't matter how religious we become. Uh, We're we're lost. We're all sinners. Um, That's bad news. The second word, salvation, sin, salvation, service, is the good news. God is totally rich in love and mercy, far more than than we could ever imagine or or give him credit for. And in his love and mercy, this is what he did. He, He sent his son to be a substitute, to take our place. Uh, Jesus was a perfect substitute because he was both fully human and fully God, and um, it's for those reasons that he was qualified to do this on the cross. Here's what happened. On the cross, God took every sin I ever have or will commit. He took every sin you ever have or will commit. He took those things off us and and put them on Jesus, and uh, Jesus was punished in our place. I told you the wages of sin is what? Death. What happened to Jesus on the cross? He died. He took our punishment. And um, he took it all. I mean, every last sin was paid for, uh, which is why a resurrection was possible. The resurrection proves that every last sin and our, our enemy of death has been totally defeated and overcome. Sin, salvation, and now finally service. Uh, here's the thing. God now, by the power of his Holy Spirit, works in our heart and gives us the gift of faith. And if we get that gift, what happens is this, is we turn away from our sin and its consequences. We turn away from trying to please God or make our own way to God, and we turn to a new life lived with and for Jesus. And uh, we get this brand new life. It's an eternal life, and we begin to live for God. We're saved with a new mission and a new purpose. And uh, we now do good works in Christ's name, and there's three reasons why we do. Reason number one, we want to show God that we're thankful. We want him to be praised with our life. Reason number two, Uh, When we do good works in Christ's name, it assures us that that this new life we have, it's not false. It's it's true. It's real. We're assured of our faith by by the fruits of our faith. And then finally, we do good works in Christ's name so that our our neighbors can be won over to Christ. Sin, salvation, service. Anyone who finally becomes a Christian realizes this. I was a lost sinner. When God, in his rich love and mercy, he came to rescue me. He he saved me. And... uh, Now I live a new life for him. Here's the reason I say we're not one of the 99. It's not like we live this perfect life. We were always with this good shepherd. We're the one. We're the one who wandered off. And Jesus, with sort of a reckless calculation and abandon, came after us. And um, that's the kind of incredible love he has for us. It wouldn't be right of us as a church to say, well, I get it. Every once in a while, there's these people totally lost, and I guess, you know, God has a heart for them, so I guess he can do it. Once you see that you're the lost sheep, I mean, you'll be inflamed with that exact same passion. Uh, When I was lost, God showed up, and now I'll be in this mission with him. At any rate, um, let's just kind of put this up on the screen so we can gather all our thoughts. God pursues the lost with, uh, number one, reckless abandon. He's the good shepherd. I mean... Leave the 99 in the open country, reckless abandon. There's a second parable. It's a shorter one. It starts in verse 8. It says, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin in the same way I tell you. There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This parable is really similar to the first one, but, but slightly different. Here's the thing. Uh, the woman knows she's lost the coin in her house. She knows it's here somewhere. And she is going to persistently, with kind of a dogged determinism, not stop searching till she finds it. 
So she lights a lamp. It's obviously night. She's been searching all day. She goes into the night. She sweeps her house with a broom. I know it's here somewhere. I'm just going to keep looking. I'm not going to give up until I find it, which I think tells us another thing about God's heart. Uh, I'll put it in these terms. There's a God pursues the lost with a dogged and relentless persistence. Right? Not only with, with reckless abandon, uncalculating risk. I mean, he'll go to any lengths. But, um, but also this, he, he's persistent. He's not going to give up. He's going to keep on trying. He, he's, the lost are so important to him, he is not going to stop. And then finally, this, uh, this third parable, the one we're talking about today, uh, it's traditionally been called the parable of the prodigal son. I, I suggest to you it's the parable of the prodigal sons. I want you to see what's, what's in the heart of the father. So this, this younger brother gives a speech, Dad, I wish you were dead. Just give me your stuff. Uh, the father goes and he has to sell off a, a big portion of his property. He, it, it's been at great cost, public shame to him. And um, the son now, the Bible talks about him coming to his senses. And he, and he has this plan. He finally says, okay, I know I've shamed my dad. I know I've wasted all this money, and uh, I've come up with my own solution. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to say, Dad, I'm going to work for you and pay you back. And uh, that's, he, he's responding to this first thing, the cost. But then he also says, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. He's got this speech rehearsed. He's going to try as best as he can to kind of fix everything himself. Now, I have a question for you. You're the father, and uh, you see your idiot son coming down the road. And uh, this idiot son of yours just wasted your entire life's savings, you know, in wild living with prostitutes and everything else. In your heart, what does he come back for? You just see him in the distance. What's he want? Some of you know. He wants more money probably, right? I mean, a fool, you know, I've been fooled once already, right? Uh, I'm not going down that road again. But this father does something so remarkable. He doesn't sit on his porch and wait for the sun to get to him. He gets off uh, his porch, and, and it's just so remarkable. It says it in the middle of verse 20, but while the sun was a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. You know, the father could have sat there dignified and said, let the sun come back and grovel. You know, let me exact my pound of flesh. Not so. When he sees him a long way off without knowing anything of what this son plans to say, he, he gets up. And, and by the way, especially in Middle Eastern culture, uh, a father would never run. You know, it would cause him to have to pick up his robes and expose his legs. I mean, it's so humiliating, but he doesn't care because it's his son. And so, uh, you know, in, in a sort of unexpected way and uh, undeserved way, he runs and he just throws his arms around the son, and the son, he, he gets his rehearsed speech out. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father won't listen to it. No, 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 listen, son. You, you don't have to pay me anything. I'm the one. I'll take the cost. The father says, quick, bring the best robe. By the way, the best robe in any household is the father's robe. Bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring out the fattened calf. My lost son is home. He was once dead, and now he's alive. Um, just to kind of categorize the thoughts. Unexpected, undeserved love. Then there's the second son when he comes home. I mean, he publicly humiliates his father and says the same thing to him. I just want your stuff. The father who's in the party, he may say to him, oh, that son, I, how could he do this to me? But instead, he leaves his guests. He leaves this important party that he's thrown. He walks outside, and although the son says to him, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Listen to his response, verse 31, my son. <laughs> I just, I hear the tenderness in his voice. Look, old man, my son, my son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. You belong to me. Now, now come on in, come on in to the feast. Come and celebrate with me. The son of mine who was dead is alive again. He was lost and he's found. Um, God pursues the lost with reckless abandon. He pursues the lost with dogged and relentless persistence. He pursues the lost with unexpected and undeserved love. I mean, what, a, what an awesome chapter of Scripture to get to the heart of God. Now, um, a couple application points, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, 
Let's give uh, these two sons a couple of names. Uh, younger son. Let's call him the son of self-discovery. Um, older son, the son of moral conformity. Here's one of the points of this parable. Both are lost. Both are alienated from the father. Whether you're a Pharisee or whether you're a sinner and tax collector, both need to be brought back to the Father. Both need his tremendous love. Now, let's talk about here at church. Um, Many of you, as I look out here, uh, you're probably identifying with one of these two sons. Uh, Both of these two things are are ways in which we try to handle the problems of life. Uh, Ways in which, even I could put it this way, we try to save ourselves. So some of us, we grew up in households that, that were terrible, the situation was less than ideal, and we began to rebel. Uh, I I can't live this way, I'm going to try and handle the problems of my life, and you embarked on a journey of self-discovery. My guess is, as I look out here, uh, that's quite a few uh, of you. You are the rebellious. You are the one who went out and lived the wild life. I mean, the reason I say that, this is Florida. Uh, Many of us, we left left Ohio, we left Michigan, we left New Jersey, we left Iowa, and uh, I'm not going to take it anymore, I'm going to go live my life my way. Uh, That's many of you. Uh, Some of you made a real mess of things in the process, and your lives have been turned upside down, and I want you to hear the kind of love that the Father has for you. He has a a reckless abandon, a kind of dogged, deterministic, you know, he, he is going to be persistent. He's going to get through your thick skull. He's calling your name, and some of you are here this morning, and you hear his voice. He has a love that comes to us through the person of Jesus Christ that's undeserved and unexpected. And uh, if you know, hey, I'm that younger son, then then I want you to hear that, that God is calling your name. Come on into the feast. You're my son. You've been lost, but but maybe you hear God, God seeking after you. Just today respond. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. There's others of us who are here today who, uh, you're the older son. Uh, You're just as lost. But um, your lostness looks a lot different. Uh, There were problems in life and you decided, okay, the way I'm going to handle all the problems in my life is is I'm going to do everything right. I'm going to follow all the rules. I'm going to, uh, you know, go to school and get good grades and I'm going to listen to everything my parents say and I, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to pray and I, I'm going to do everything. And, and finally, um, listen, it's, it's not that you have a relationship with God. You just, it's like you want to make sure that at the end of your life, God owes you something. And um, you too are just as lost. And as I look out on our congregation, let, let me put it this way. In a church like this, there's all kinds of people, and, and we're just mixed together. And uh, there's two different ways that we could be thinking. There are two radically different ways. One way is this. You may think this. I obey, therefore I'm accepted. I've lived a good life. I, I've done everything I'm supposed to do, and now, God, you owe me. When I pray, you're supposed to answer and give me your stuff. If that's you, you're just as lost as the older brother. There's a second way, and it's this. It's the way of the cross. I'm accepted, therefore I obey. Uh, there's this God who, who just unbelievably, although I don't deserve it at all, and I, 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 in fact, never want a relationship with him, but in my heart just wanted to prove myself and say that I'm okay, and I don't need you, God. God, he just keeps on knocking at the door, and... Um, In a church like this, um, where there's a bunch of religious people, uh, we're all mixed in together. And uh, what you need to hear is that the older brother is just as lost as the younger brother. And if maybe you're hearing that for the first time, maybe you're realizing, okay, I I get it. Finally, it's it's this relationship with God that comes through Jesus Christ. and, And it's not that I want his stuff, I want him. Then I'd urge you just the same. There is this father who has this tremendous passion to seek and save the lost. Come to him. Today, put your faith in him. Feel that you are accepted, that it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how religious you are. It just matters that you're his child. 
And so I, I call upon you as well. Just Jesus is calling. Come. Here's the interesting thing about the older brother. We know that the younger brother takes the invitation of the father. He comes into the feast and is celebrating. He, he receives that salvation. The older brother, uh, we don't know. I mean, the parable ends before we're told. Does, does he come in? Does he join the party? Or does he walk away mad? And um, to all those who are the older brother types, the religious types, uh, the challenge, the, the word, the, this, this parable, now it ends in your lap. Come, there is a father who with sort of reckless abandon, dogged determinism, and unexpected and undeserved love is calling your name.